property and behavior, thus excluding such actions as violence, depravity, perfidy, uh, fraud, and other acts considered universally as antisocial and grossly disrespectful. Canon 1626, a mistake of fact is not permitted to be argued when the alleged actions by the person are grossly unreasonable. 1627, in the permitted admission of a mistake of fact, any assured surety for liability from alleged injury ceases to exist. Canon 1628, a person is not considered to consent who commits a mistake. 1629, any person permitted to admit a mistake of fact must be offered relief to any alleged injury in addition to cessation of any claimed surety for any liabilities associated with the alleged injury. Canon 1630, any competent authority that refuses to release a person from surety for any liability upon permitted admission of mistake of fact fully consents to assume the liability for themselves. Canon 1631, any competent authority that refuses to offer relief to a person upon permitted admission of mistake of fact is guilty of fraud and gross injury to the law. Canon 1632, when a person has been deliberately deceived by fraud, then neither mistake nor injury exists. And Canon 1633, excluding fraud, consent obviates a mistake. Thank you, Brian. There was a lot to get through. Thank you. So just referring to um, to what, uh, what Michael Joseph was saying, and I, I know that this has been a subject matter that has been discussed um, several times by several people, um, this idea of uh, apologising. And what um, may not have been clear when you've heard of this idea of apology is what form of law and what um, principle of law uh, is being called uh, when this is done. <clears throat> I know sometimes people have referred to its scriptural nature, but I, I, I ask for that not to, be, that not to be a distraction. Yes, there is a scriptural element to it, but it is a, a now well-established uh, commercial reality that when you apologise for a mistake, then effectively uh, when it's in a reasonable um, uh, consideration, then you are removing yourself as surety, and then the uh, the official adjudicating the matter uh, must then offer some kind of remedy. <clears throat> now, again, judges and magistrates um, are far from knowledgeable of their own law, much less the law in general and the principles of law. So don't expect every judge and magistrate to do the right thing. <clears throat> in fact, always err on the side that the judge and the magistrate is as ignorant as everybody else in their own court. But I hope this clarifies for those on the call and those that listen to this call, what is the principle and form underpinning why an apology at the appropriate time for the appropriate issue is extremely powerful. Great, thank you for that, Brian. Okay, Bye. Frank. Um, so if you could re uh, kind of go back over each point because under UCC you're uh, establishing standing as not being shorty so you are requesting the court for something and and that part wasn't uh, covered so you're requesting relief or remedy at that point and then if the, they leave and come back and you reestablish standing under uh, maritime common law uh, you've got to reestablish standing there is a whole different element that you're asking for, care and maintenance, correct? Yes, yeah. So, and by the way, that's not common law in the second one, but yes. Yeah, let, let's start with the first. Okay. okay, start with the first. Okay. okay, yeah. So, the first, how do they get you into the jurisdiction? Well, as I said, when they arrest you and summons you, um, they already have you on, on, on two points. That is, unrebutted, um, silence is consent, well, they consider it is consent, uh, for you to act as surety. So they assume that, particularly when they are arresting you and summonsing you on the all caps name of the SESTA KV Trust, and that is exactly the same trust that you have been uh, using, their property, 
you have been using in having a license, social security, bank account, and all these other benefits that are provided through the SESTA KV Trust. So they got you on that one first. The second is the concept of the thing, the thing being the controversy, that by creating the controversy, you have become a thing. That's the, that's the legal perversion that they do. But by converting you by controversy into a thing, if they have to come back into court a second time under canon law, then uh, woe be us, because they can very easily and virtually immediately call for contempt if we continue to try and defend ourselves. And normally, and sadly, most people do not know what to do, and if they push the matter, they will go to jail for some time. So let's just go back and, and answer that, and I'll, I'll answer that now, Terry, about the first form of, of law that we face when we enter their court, the UCC. So I think it's relevant while I do this just to, to answer once and for all, this continuing fraud where they claim that common law still exists. And unfortunately, many people still believe that common law exists. Most countries now, under terrorist legislation, have stated clearly that they can arrest and detain without charge and that they have suspended habeas corpus being the right to be heard and to be heard on what charge you are being held within a reasonable time. Now, the origin of those rights I don't think is relevant for this call, but there is a history to them. What is relevant is habeas corpus is the centre of canon law. If a country has suspended habeas corpus, then ipso facto, by fact of law, they have suspended common law. You cannot have common law if habeas corpus and the right to know by what uh, statute you have been charged is not uh, known and the right to a fair trial and the right to see uh, the information and the evidence by which you're being charged. When those things are being denied, which they are in the UK, in Australia, in America, in Canada, and in many parts of the world, then no one reasonably, rationally, and sensibly could possibly conclude that common law still exists unless, unless they are still romantically inclined to the Hollywood version of patriotism and romanticism and liberty and the fact that they lie to us every single day by saying that these courts still hold common law. So I hope I really hope that we are not sucked into the continued mask and outrageous fraud and lie that common law in any fashion exists today in the courts of law of Roman-controlled countries. So, sorry for that tub-thumping speech, but I have heard that when I have made the comment before, an absolute fact that common law is dead, that uh, it has upset a few people uh, where they've repudiated it. The evidence uh, to prove the truth of my comment is overwhelming, and if one is to suspend the romantic notion in their mind and look at the facts, then the facts are overwhelming to support the reality that common law is dead and buried, except for the fact that judges, lawyers, and politicians continue to vomit the idea that common law exists. So when you go to court, the first form of law that you face is not common law, it is commercial code. And the commercial code is simply this. When they charge you, uh, they are charging you an injury um, where the injury is assigned to the uh, corporate person uh, of the SESTA KV, the body corporate, and the SESTA KV is a, uh, a SESTA KV trust which they have created and they claim is owned. You, in using the property, the body corporate, uh, are implied to accept the surety and unrebutting the summons or hearing to come to court have already established 
a precedent just to the court that you've accepted the surety. And unless you state to the contrary when you go to court and start to argue, uh, the issue that you are or are not surety is mute. It's just a question of whether you argue uh, to what degree uh, you are liable. Now, the only way that you can uh, easily, relatively easily, um, um, remove yourself in a commercial court from the um, assumption of surety is to state clearly that you are coming to the court in a different role. You are not coming to the court as the surety to the corporate fiction. Uh, you are coming in one of two ways. <clears throat> I have heard of people coming to the court and simply saying, I come to this court as a living man and not as a corporate fiction. Therefore, how can I defend myself when this court will only hear corporate matters? I have heard that defence working, and it's a reasonable defence. In, in that case, what uh, a competent person, a person knowledgeable clearly by making these comments is showing, is that they realise the courts are dealing with corporations, body corporates of sister KB trusts and estates, and not with flesh. So clearly, if one claims to be flesh and one clearly says that I am not the surety to corporate fiction and appeals to the fact that you cannot defend yourself in a court if you are not a corporation or surety for a corporation, then the judge has no choice then but to dismiss it if they want to dismiss it. Or if they want to challenge it, of course, the judge will almost certainly run out of the court that instant and come back getting ready in the high court in maritime law, in canon law, to charge you with contempt. Now, if, if you don't go down that road of saying I'm the man, the other option is, um, in your knowledge of, of the fact that a divine trust and a true trust has been created already and is clearly stated in the uh, canons, positive law, then you can say, um, you know, Your Honour, I, I stand here as a trustee of an expressed trust, not as a surety to a sister KV. Now, if that's the case, then the judge has a real problem. Because now what you're saying is, is not simply that you are no longer the surety of a corporate fiction, but that they can't even claim <clears throat> that you are uh, consenting in any fashion to being surety because you're not coming to them in commerce and trade as the uh, beneficiary using the corporate um, name of a sister KVV, you're coming to them as a trustee of a wholly different trust. Now, I, I <clears throat> would uh, strongly advise that uh, these are not words that you simply cough up uh, in a court matter without having read positive law three, four, five times and know exactly what we mean by trust, divine trust, true trust, estate, sister KV. But if you have read that, then you'll understand what I'm saying. It makes perfect sense. So, Terry, does that answer the first form of law, being the UCC? Yes, that answers the first uh, situation, in a court situation. And, uh, and so, continue then with the next uh, when they come back in under the Canon Maritime. Okay. Well, under the Canons of 983, um, they no longer use terms like uh, sailor uh, of a ship. They use the concept of, of a traveller. <clears throat> so under, under uh, Canon Law of 1983, there's essentially only, only two things that you can be. A thing or a person. And what you don't ever want to be is a thing. So in order to establish your um, position under canon law, um, very simply, uh, is to, to establish that uh, I stand before you as a living man. The blood flows, the flesh lives. And, Your Honour, I ask uh, for cure and maintenance. Now, why would you call cure and maintenance under canon law? Uh, because in the most ancient form of canon law and the principles of canon law, maritime law, um, under what's called the rule of Oleron, 
from which the earliest kennel